Um, I'm going to give a presentation on the paradigm code. So this is uh, the longer version of the talk that I gave last week um, in, the, in the first day of this non-local codes event. Um, so that'll give me a chance to dive into a lot more details. So I welcome questions as I'm going through this, uh, either in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. I'll try to answer them. Um, let's see, this talk draws from uh, not only the, the talk I gave last week, but also from some short courses that I've given at conferences with Pablo Sellison and John Foster. Um, those short courses were focused on computational paradynamics in general. And this talk is much more focused on paradigms specifically. Uh, hopefully this is useful to people who are thinking about giving paradigm a try. And even if you're not, even if you're writing your own codes, which is sometimes the best thing to do, um, hopefully some of the ideas here will help you and, uh, and even some of the specific software tools. Okay, so paradigm is a, a mesh-free paradynamics code. So it's very similar to what Pablo just presented in the, for the 2D MATLAB portion of the talks. Um, it's a C++ code written originally at Sandia. He uses the Trilino software packages, which are also open source C++ code um, that was originated at Sandia. A lot of people have contributed to Paradigm. I listed a few of them here, uh, myself, Michael Parks, John Mitchell, uh, all of which the, the three of us are at Sandia, John Foster at the University of Texas and Patrick Deal at LSU. Um, at the time that we started Paradigm, um, Mike, John and myself were technical staff in the same department along with Stuart Silling. Um, and our goal was to write an implementation of Stuart's mesh-free paradynamics um, in a massively parallel C++ code that we could make open source. We wanted it to be usable by, by people who just want to run simulations, so sort of analyst mode, uh, engineering analyst mode, and also useful for people who want to do methods development. So we tried to make the code extensible as well. Uh, while I'm on this slide, I wanted to mention a document that I wrote a few years ago called the Roadmap for software implementation or the roadmap for paradynamic software implementation that I cited at the bottom there. A lot of the ideas that I talk about here are explained in more detail in that uh, report. It's also a, a chapter in the handbook of paradynamic modeling. Okay, so I have one slide on the theory of what's implemented in Paradigm. And hopefully you were all able to see Pablo's talk. He, he did a great job explaining a lot more detail on these things. So Paradigm is, does have some multi-physics capabilities, but the core set of equations that Paradigm solves are mechanics equations. So at the top, you have the, the paradynamic balance of linear momentum in the state-based form. Um, the mesh-free discretization uh, that Silling and Ascari published in 2005 is shown on the next line. So that's a really straightforward direct discretization of the strong form. Simply replace the, the integral with the sum. Um, and I tried to illustrate that on the right. So in, instead of having an infinite number of neighboring material points, now in the discretized form, you have some finite number of neighbors, which depends on your mess, mesh resolution. Uh, the terms inside the brackets represent the constitutive model. So in state-based paradynamics, we write that as a force state that acts on bonds. And as you all know, a primary reason for using paradynamics is to capture material failure. And we do that in the mesh-free method by uh, the breaking or weakening of paradynamic bonds. And then I include the sort of the three seminal papers from Stewart and others that form the backbone of, of everything that's in paradigm. Okay, so let me just give you a brief tour of everything that's in the code. Um, the discretization is an important piece. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I have some example problems that I'll show you in a bit where I provide a lot more detail on this. Uh, the short story is that paradigm supports either uh, meshless discretization or it can work on a hex or tet mesh and convert it internally. 
into a meshless discretization. Uh, we use the Exodus or Genesis file format. Those are the same thing. Exodus is the output and Genesis is the input, um, which is a, a nice, uh, efficient, and relatively simple file format, binary file format for engineering analysis codes. The time integrators, so this is one of the differentiating capabilities of Paradigm. So it can do both explicit dynamics and also uh, implicit time integration for quasi-statics, for example. Um, those of you who have worked with this know that, you know, coding up the explicit dynamics algorithms Velocity Verlet, for example, is, is pretty straightforward, even in parallel, but the implicit solves are a lot more involved. Um, so for example, Paradigm can construct a tangent stiffness matrix and then solve those problems using linear solvers from, from Trulinos. Um, yeah, there's some multi-physics capabilities in Paradigm I'm gonna to talk today, I think exclusively about mechanics. Uh, the mechanics capabilities are a lot more mature. Um, uh, just real briefly, some of the, so the multi-physics capabilities that are available are things like thermomechanical, or there's a diffusion model and paradigm. There's some capabilities to do strongly coupled problems. Those were implemented essentially on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there is a general interface for one-way coupling uh, that was put in. I, I was trying to solve a problem at one point where we were modeling turbine blades and you know, they're exposed to really high temperatures and the temperatures affect the mechanical deformation, mechanical response, but the mechanical response really doesn't affect the temperature field. Um, so it, it is legitimately a one-way problem. And we, we wrote codes such that you can run standalone thermal simulation uh, and take the output from that and read that into paradigm. So time dependent and space dependent temperature history, and then use that uh, in your paradynamic simulation, for example, with the material model, it's temperature dependent. Um, so you could use that. It doesn't have to be temperature. It could be most any field that you're interested in. Um, Paradigm has a pretty well-developed proximity search. So that's something that Pablo mentioned as well as an important aspect of a paradynamics code. This is a case where we're, we're leveraging uh, research done outside the mechanics community, right? The finding nearest neighbors is a well-developed, uh, well-studied problem in, in literature in general for graphics and whatnot. So we use things like the KD tree search algorithm. Um, the constitutive model interface in Paradigm, is something worth pointing out, it's pretty well-developed. We support, um, it's written in terms of state-based paradynamics, but that, also supports bond-based paradynamics. You could think of bond-based as a special case of state-based. Uh, there's a handful of material models that are implemented and distributed with Paradigm. Uh, we do have a general interface for non-ordinary state-based models. Uh, there was a question in the last talk about zero energy modes. Pablo did a nice job of explaining that, um, giving an overview of that situation. So as, as he said, um, zero energy modes only affect non-ordinary state-based models, and it's a result of computing the average deformation gradient, which, you know, based on the deformations of all your neighbors, and as you can imagine, there are many different combinations of deformations of, of neighbors that would result in the same average deformation. So the zero energy part comes when, you know, the, the neighbors are able to move between those different uh, configurations that all give you the same deformation gradient. So basically you have the ability of nodes to move around and not affect the, uh, the strain tensor, uh, hence zero energy modes. So in paradigm, we have a penalty term that is that you can apply to stabilize that. It, it, the short story is it penalizes modes that uh, run counter to the average deformation. Um, another way one could do it is simply superimpose a very weak uh, elastic bond-based model. Really anything that creates, uh, removes the zero energy deformation modes, um, such that there is an energy associated with every deformation mode. So I apologize, I don't have a slide on that, but I wanted to touch on it uh, based on the question in the last talk. <clears throat> 
Um, yeah, and then finally, I'll mention contact. So again, this is a, the, the actual contact model is very simple. It's the short range force contact model that Stewart and uh, others introduced in the 2005 paper. Uh, the tricky part from an implementation point of view uh, is the proximity search to do that in three dimensions in parallel. Uh, so again, it uh, leverages KD trees and quad trees and other search algorithms from Trilinos. Okay, here's an outline of all the topics I wanted to go through in the tutorial here. Um, some of this you saw last week. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about obtaining and building paradigm, I'll walk you through the steps for an analysis. And then I have three example problems that I can step through in some detail. So um, hopefully they cover all the, the important aspects of paradigm, the key features. And then at the end, I'll talk about extending paradigm, um, adding a material model, adding a compute class, which I'll talk more about later. And then I have three sort of special topics, which are examples of how paradigm can be used, has been used for, um, for research projects. Okay, so obtaining and building paradigm. Um, paradigm is an open source code. It's on GitHub. You can clone the repository. That part's pretty straightforward. It's a C++ code. Uh, so you do need a mainstream C++ compiler. You need an MPI compiler as well, like MPitch or OpenMPI. There's a handful of dependencies for Paradigm, which I list here. By far the most significant is Trilinos. And I have a word of caution there on the right that the Trilinos build process is, uh, is complicated, relatively speaking. Um, as I said last week, if I, if, if I am working on a brand new machine that doesn't have anything installed, it takes me the better part of the day to get all the dependencies and Trilinos and Paradigm to build and pass the tests. I, I think that if you're new to high performance computing or new to Trilinos, it, it could take you longer than that. So I guess the solution I can provide is to um, give you moral support and say, if you have specific questions, you can post those on the, uh, the GitHub site for Paradigm or for Trilinos as well. Um, and hopefully we can get you through, through whatever hurdles you run into. Um, once you get Trilinos built, uh, building Paradigm is actually quite straightforward. I use the CMake and I have an example script there at the bottom. Trilinos also uses CMake. Um, okay, so now that you have it built in the most, the recommended way to get familiar with Paradigm is to run the example problems. So the Paradigm repository includes a, a handful of example problems. It also includes a larger number of regression and verification tests and a test suite that you can run from the command line with CMake. Um, the example problems were written specifically to give people an introduction to all the capabilities in Paradigm. Uh, the test suite, on the other hand, was written in most cases to test very specific features of Paradigm. So it's useful to search through if you want to see examples of different features being used and what the options in the input deck might be. Um, but on the other hand, some of those tests don't make a lot of sense as standalone physical simulations. They were contrived just to trigger a certain code behavior to make sure it did what we intended it to do. Um, yeah, so I break down paradigm simulations in four steps, creating a discretization, creating an input deck, running the code, and post-processing the results. I'll give you a general overview of those steps. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll dive into the specific examples. Um, so step number one would be creating the discretization. Uh, so under the hood, what Paradigm actually operates on is a very simple mesh-free discretization, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates for each node, a volume associated with each node, and then nodes are grouped into blocks. Um, so block is, is a, it's just a concept that we use that allows us to map things like material models or damage models to different regions of the discretization. The other concept that comes up in the discretization is node sets. So node sets are used to uh, apply boundary conditions, right? So the example I'm showing here, this tensile bar uh, simulation, 
it's only a single material, so you would just have one block, and you'd presumably have uh, node sets at the top and the bottom, which you would then use to assign boundary conditions to the problem to, to apply the tensile loading. Um, at, at Sandia, we use a mesh generator called Qubit. Um, unlike almost all the other software that I talk about today, Qubit does require a license, uh, which is not free. So I understand people, not everybody's going to have access to Qubit. Um, but if you do have access to Qubit, right, you generate, it's a, it's a finite element mesh generator. So uh, the primary use case would be hex or tet meshes. Um, those get saved into a Genesis file, and then Paradigm's able to read those and convert the hex or tet mesh into a mesh-free discretization. So that operation's done just by taking each element, finding the center of the element, that's where the node ends up, and then the volume associated with that node is simply the volume of the initial element. So pretty straightforward. Uh, if you were, if you had access to a different mesh generator, I think that you could adapt that for use with Paradigm pretty easily, either by converting it into a Genesis file yourself or by writing code in Paradigm to read a different mesh format. Okay, second option we have is uh, text files. So that's very straightforward. I'll show you that in one of the examples. The, the thinking there was, okay, if somebody doesn't have access to Qubit, they could write their own little code, Fortran code, C code, they could use MATLAB, um, whatever they want to lay out the, the nodes in their mesh-free discretization and just read it straight into Paradigm. We also have a, a utility that we send out with Paradigm to allow you to convert that to a Genesis file. It's a pre-processing operation, which is handy because then you can say load it into Paraview and visualize it. Um, the third option I have here, it, Paradigm does have an internal mesh generator, but it's, it's relatively speaking very limited. Um, can generate a rectangular or a cylindrical solid, and we just use that for testing. So if you're running Paradigm, options one and two are definitely the best choices. Okay, so Paradigm operates with, uh, you need a mesh and you need an input deck. So the input deck is just a text file. And uh, I think I'll move pretty quickly through this because there's a lot more details than the example problems. Um, but I will say we, we did our best to make this human readable and logically organized. Um, again, we use the concepts of blocks and node sets to associate material models with different regions in the mesh and to uh, associate boundary conditions with different, um, with different regions of the mesh as well. Um, running the code is pretty straightforward, right? So it's uh, you run it from the command line. Uh, here, I'm, the example I'm showing is uh, using MPI to run on eight cores. This is a screenshot from my Mac laptop. If you were running on a, on a bigger cluster, you'd presumably use whatever job submission script system they have in place like Slurm. Um, yeah, and I, I will mention that if you run in parallel, you do have to pre-decompose the mesh, but there's uh, plenty of tools available for that. Uh, the Secus tools, uh, which is a, a library of different tools that operate on Exodus and Genesis files that ships with Trilinos. So if you build everything, as I mentioned earlier, then you already have that installed. Um, it's just a one line command to decompose your mesh. All right. Um, yeah, and again, I'll move quickly through this, this slide because there are more details in the examples. Um, but I'll say now that Paradigm generates an Exodus file or a set of Exodus files if you run in parallel. Those can be loaded directly into Paraview, which that's the screenshot I'm showing here. So Paraview is freely distributed um, and there is no, no fee associated with the license. Uh, it has a whole bunch of post-processing capabilities. Making images is the probably the most common use case. It's also possible to load Exodus files into a Python script. There's an exodus.py module that makes that really easy. And I find that incredibly convenient. And uh, lots of command line tools with Secus that allow you to pull data out of Exodus files. And uh, I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in some of the examples. Okay, um, 
let me get into those examples. I, I, I picked three out of the paradigm out of the paradigm repository: the wave and bar simulation, a disk impact, and a tensile test simulation. And in each case, I you know I broke it down into the four steps: the the discretization, the input file, running the code, and post processing. Um, so wave and bar is was created as an example problem um, with the intention of having the simplest possible simulation to help people get familiar with the code. Um, the discretization uses a text file discretization, and we included this Python script in the example file directory. So it's real straightforward. I'm laying out a rectangular grid of nodes in this Python script, um, associating a volume with each one of those nodes. And, uh, and then I grab the nodes on the end of the bar uh, and put them into a node set. So I actually have screenshots here of the, the text file for the discretization and also for the node sets. So the, the entries in the discretization text file are just the X, Y, Z coordinates. The, the block ID, which is one, there's only one block in the simulation, and then the volume associated with it because it's a uniform grid, the volumes are all equal. And then to define the node sets, we have separate text files, which just list the node IDs for each node in the text file. So that corresponds to the, the line number in the, uh, in the discretization text file. All right, oh, I should also, I, while I'm at it, I'll mention that, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier. We do have a script called text to Exodus that we distribute with Paradigm. So you could take these text files and run this Python script and they'll convert that information into a genesis file um, that for large simulations that definitely works better with paradigm to use the binary file format it also allows you to double check your work in uh, in paraview before you run the simulation right load the load the discretization and have a look at it to make sure the node sets are where you think they are etc okay so here's the input deck for the wave and bar simulation um, Hopefully it's self-explanatory. Let me walk you through some of the steps. So we define the, the discretization with a couple lines there, just point, par point paradigm to the text file. Um, I define a material model. In this case, it's a, the material model is the elastic model. So this is the linear paradynamic solid model. Um, I, as I said, there's just one block and I assign the material model to the block. So you can imagine if we had multiple bodies in the simulation that you'd have multiple entries here uh, under the blocks section of the input deck. Um, then I have a section on the boundary conditions. So in this case, I'm applying, the way I set the simulation up is to give the entire bar an initial velocity in the horizontal direction. And then I fixed the right end of the bar in, in all three dimensions so that it's it's basically simulating a bar moving through space and hitting a, a rigid wall, for example. Um, right, and then I specify the solver. So in the easiest possible case we could come up with, with was explicit dynamics with a, uh, in this case, I just, so paradigm can internally compute the critical time step. In this case, I'm applying a safety factor to that. So. That's very common in all engineering simulations that use explicit dynamics. We know with, we estimate what the critical time step is, and then we apply some safety factor to be very confident that we're not exceeding the critical time step. And then, yeah, I specify what quantities I want in the output file and the, uh, the frequency of output, et cetera. Okay, so here's an, this very small simulation. So I just run it in parallel, no need for an MPI command. Uh, looks like it takes a total of five and a half seconds. Um, not much to explain here, except if you're running a longer simulation, you'll, you'll see the progress bar chugging along to indicate how much time is left. It does spit out information at the beginning about what the computed stable time step is and uh, Right, then you apply, in this case, we're applying a safety factor, as I said, so list what the actual time step is that's used in the simulation. Um, and then also tells you the number of time steps that it's gonna take. 
right? And then post-processing. So in this case, I'm just taking the Exodus files that are written by, by Paradigm and loading them into Paraview. So that's the screenshot in the upper right. Um, just a little information about what exactly I'm doing in Paraview. So I used uh, a glyph filter to put the spheres in the visualization because I think it looks a little nicer. Uh, and then I colored it all by velocity in the X direction and exported a PNG file out of Paraview, which is the, the image that I'm showing there at the bottom. So limitless possibilities in Paraview. Okay, so let me move on to uh, example number two, in case, unless anybody has any questions on the first one. So the, the three examples sort of grow in complexity as we go through them. Uh, this is the disk impact example. So this is, Stuart published this, uh, a very similar simulation in his 2005 paper on, on meshless paradynamics. And so we see a lot of folks, including me and Pablo, um, reproducing this simulation. In this case, I'm using qubit to generate the mesh. Um, and I show a screenshot of Qubit there at the bottom, and I show you the, the script that I use for Qubit there on the right. So that's, again, that, that script is something that's distributed with, with Paradigm. Um, so in this case, it's, the plate is modeled with a hex mesh, and the sphere is modeled with the tet mesh. And uh, you know, I, I assign a, a node set to the sphere so that I can give it an initial velocity. And I break the problem into two different blocks so that I can give different material properties to the plate and to the sphere. And then in this simulation, I'm going to apply, I'm going to use a damage model on the plate, but not on the sphere. So only the plate can break. Um, here's the input deck. So slightly more complicated than the last one. Uh, like I said, there's two different materials. I call them here the disk material and the ball material. So they're both elastic, but they have different material properties. And then I define the critical stretch damage model. The only parameter there is the, the value of the critical stretch. And you can see in the block section how I apply the material models to the different blocks in the discretization. And I applied the damage model to only one of those, the, uh, the disk block. Um, right. So I think the contact section here is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we do we have a, a parameter for the search radius for the contact search, um, and you define the two blocks that are going to interact with contact and uh, give it a spring constant, which is really the only constant in the short-range force model. Um, yeah, I mentioned boundary conditions. It's just an initial velocity on the ball. Uh, yeah, so let me talk for just a second here about compute classes. So I haven't, I mentioned them very briefly at the beginning, but didn't provide any detail. So one of the design features in Paradigm is uh, the ability to write what we call a compute class, which really gives the developer access at uh, certain points along the simulation, basically at every time step, gives you access to all of the, the fields in the simulation and it's intended to be very general so that you can really compute whatever you want. Um, and we, with the paradigm just um, distribution, we include maybe a dozen compute classes. One of those is called block data. And that's the one I'm using here. So the, the notion of that compute class is to allow you to compute uh, either a sum or a min or a max value over all of the nodes in a block. So what I wanted to do here as for an example for this, uh, for this tutorial is compute the average velocity of the sphere, um, right? The sphere itself deforms, so every point has a slightly different velocity. Uh, using the block data compute class, I, I asked Paradigm to compute for me the sum of the velocities in the x, y, and z directions for all of the nodes in the sphere, and to output those as a new variable, which is called the sphere underscore velocity. So I define that uh, quantity of interest here in the compute class section of the input deck, and then I write it to output. And you'll see here uh, another feature I can point out for this in this simulation is the fact that we have two different output files. 
uh, you could have, I guess, infinitely many output files from Paradigm. Uh, in this case, there, the first one, out, which is called output underscore one, is, is sort of your standard output that includes the entire mesh, right? So you can load it into Paraview and visualize a field over the mesh, right? That makes sense. The second one is uh, an output file that is written at a much higher frequency, but includes only global data. So there is no mesh written to the second output file. It's only writing two quantities. In this case, the global kinetic energy and the sphere velocity. So this is the fact that we can have these two different output files with very different output frequencies and have um, the second one be, you know, not use the mesh. So it's a much, much, much smaller output file that helps us with managing our data, right? Because you'll see I created a plot with the, it shows the sphere velocity over time. And if I were to do that using output files that contain the entire mesh, I would have to write a very large amount of data to file. Um, so hence the, the two output file strategy. The second one, uh, just based on history, we call that a history file and it has a dot H suffix. Paradigm figures that out automatically if you ask for an output file that only contains global variables. Okay, so in this case, uh, I opted to run the code on eight processors. Again, still all these examples just are run on a laptop. They're not particularly large. They were originally written, uh, tells you a bit about the age of the code. It's about 10 years old. They were originally written to make sure they could all run on a, uh, most people's computers in about 10 minutes. And at this point, they run a lot faster than that because computers have gotten faster, which is great. Um, right, and when you run in parallel, there are some performance metrics that get dumped to output, which I'm showing here, shows you, you can glean something, some information about the, the parallel load balance by looking at the min and max values for different um, aspects of the code execution. All right, so last step, post-processing. Um, again, Exodus files come out of Paradigm and I can load them straight into Paraview, which I'm showing here in the lower left. Uh, and then I provide a little bit more detail here on different options for post-processing. So I said, as I said on the last slide, I wanted to track the sphere velocity over time. Um, so that's just an example of a quantity of interest that you might care about in a simulation. So I defined that sphere velocity variable, which was the sum of this, the, uh, the velocities for every node in the sphere. I use the block data compute class for that. So to, uh, to post-process it, I, uh, I used a CCUS utility called blot, which just allows me to access the binary file format and get the raw data out and write that to a text file. I divided by the number of nodes in the sphere to get a single value for the average velocity of the sphere. And then I, I chose to use GNU plot uh, to create the plot, which I'm showing there in the lower right. Of course, everybody has their own favorite sets of tools. So, um, you know, you could, one could use MATLAB, one could do this all in a Python script, one could use Microsoft Excel, um, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Our hope is that uh, we could give you the tools and paradigm to uh, facilitate you using your your favorite post-processing tools. Okay, um, I think this is the third and final example problem that I wanted to walk through. This is, the first two were explicit dynamics. Uh, first one, just wave propagation. The second one, slightly more complicated and involved contact and material failure. Uh, this one is a quasi-static simulation um, of a tensile bar. It's a very standard mechanical test. Um, as you can see, the creating the discretization here is a little bit more complicated, right? It's not just a sphere or a very simple geometry. There's curvature to the, the, the dog bone specimen. And so I just, I won't go through this in great detail, but I've included here in this slide the, the sets of commands that were used in Qubit to generate the mesh. Also highlighting some of the features in Qubit, like the APRI Pro uh, pre 
pre-pre-processing commands. Um, so, right, I, I'm able to define certain geometric quantities and, you know, as variables and use them in the script here. But uh, in the big picture, we're still writing a Genesis file. In this case, it's a hex mesh. Right, so the input deck, I had to break this one into two slides or else you use like size four font, which I didn't think people would be able to read. Um, so things that are different between this input deck and the last couple that I showed you. Um, well, not too much on this slide, right? We see the, uh, well, I guess I'm defining a implicit time integrator. So if you see in the solver section there, instead of um, velocity relay, I'm asking for a quasi static time integration with four load steps. Um, and giving a tolerance for the solvers, which you'll see how that works in the two slides later when I show you the output. Um, the boundary conditions are pretty straightforward, except I will point out that, you know, if you look at the boundary condition block there and the top, the, uh, the very top boundary condition, you'll see that it's a function of Y and a function of T. So this is using a feature in Paradigm where a user can provide a function and explain there's an expression parser in Paradigm um, that converts that into you know, commands for applying the boundary conditions. So in this case, I want to apply that there's, there's uh, node sets at the top and the bottom of the dog bone specimen, and I want to apply a linear displacement over those node sets in the vertical direction. So I'm pulling the bar apart. And I want that to, to grow over time, right? There's four load steps. I want to watch what happens to the bar uh, not that interesting for an elastic simulation, but if you were using a plasticity model, you would certainly need to break it into a uh, finite number of load steps. And we, you'll see, if you, if you dive into the details of paradigm input decks, you'll see that this, this type of expression parser functionality is used in other cases as well. Um, for example, you can define an influence function however you want using a function written in C code uh, in the input deck. And, Paradigm converts that under the hood. Uh, other boundary conditions are straightforward here. They're basically eliminating rigid body modes uh, for the dog mode specimen, which is important for a quasi-static simulation. Um, the, my use of compute classes in this example problem are more complicated. Uh, one thing we wanted to do is see if paradigm would accurately reproduce the engineering stress and strain um, that you would measure in the laboratory experiment using a strain gauge. So we define what, what I call like a virtual strain gauge. So really there's, it works by tracking the deformations of two points uh, on the dog bone, which are, you know, an inch and a half apart or something like that. Uh, so I, as you, if you walked through this carefully, you'd see I, I used this compute class called nearest point data. I'm basically asking Paradigm to track the quantities of interest at a specific location. Paradigm does that by finding the node in the discretization that is the closest to that point. Uh, I'm tracking the initial positions and the deformations of, of two points at the top and the bottom of the uh, virtual strain gauge. And that'll make more sense, I think, in another slide or two. So I define those quantities in the um, compute class definitions, and then I request them as part of this list of output to be written to the Exodus file. So you'll see like gauge top displacement, gauge bottom displacement, um, the initial position. So with that, those data allow me to compute the engineering strain and then for engineering stress, I ask for the reaction force at the top and the bottom of the model, um, right? It's quasi-static, so the reaction force is zero everywhere except uh, the node sets where I'm applying the boundary conditions, right? So I can then divide by the cross-sectional area to get the engineering stress. All right, so this is the output that comes when you run a quasi-static simulation with Paradigm. Uh, it looks different, obviously. So it, for each load step, well, it starts by dumping some information from the nearest point compute class to tell you, okay, you, re, you ask for a certain requested location. Here's the actual location that we're going to use where there happens to be a node in the discretization. 
Uh, and then for each of the four load steps, it, it, dumps the, uh, it dumps the residual as it solves the minimization problem. Um, so that's obviously very useful for, for tracking convergence behavior or detecting when your code is not converging. And then at the end, same thing as before, dumps uh, time statistics for each of the different aspects of the simulation. All right, so post-processing, very similar in spirit to what I did with the disk impact simulation, um, extracting the quantities of interest out of the binary output files using a CECUS utility, then using GNU plot, which happens to be my favorite plotting program to, to plot the results. And in this case, I can plot in blue the uh, engineering stress, engineering strain values that are at the four load steps of the paradigm simulation and compare those to the predicted values, which is you know, essentially the elastic modulus and material. Uh, and sure enough, they match up pretty well, which, which is a nice verification problem. Okay, so I think I'm at the end of the example problems. I, uh, I'd invite any questions on those. Uh, otherwise, I can move on and talk about extending paradigm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll talk briefly about the software interface for adding a material model and adding a compute class. And then I'll talk about three use cases where paradigm was um, employed for research. So this is a, a schematic of the software architecture for Paradigm, right? So the Paradigm is represented by this dashed line. You see the input deck and the discretization going in and the output file coming out. And then inside the hood are all these different pieces. And the ones that I highlight in orange are ones where we assumed people would want to write their own routines. So an obvious example is material models as an active area of research for Paradynamics damage models, contact models, and compute classes, um, which I think I've talked about each of those individually already. Um, I'll just show you briefly what the interface looks like for material models and for compute classes. So again, Paradigm is a C++ code. It's an object-oriented code. So we have uh, the interface for material models is defined by the material model base class. If you want to implement your own model, you derive from that base class. Um, excuse me, the one non-trivial function that you have to implement is the compute force function. And I'm showing you the interface for that here. So Paradigm will hand to the material model uh, essentially a list of points that you need to compute the force for, uh, the neighbor information for all of those points. And then it gives you access to the data manager where all the different fields are stored. Right, so different material models rely on different fields. Um, so this, this is intended to be general and to support all of those cases. Um, I'll point out that this was written in a way such that all of the parallel aspects of the, all parallel communication and MPI uh, mapping of local and global IDs and all of that is completely hidden from the material model developer. So when you write your compute force function, you don't have to think at all about parallel communication that's handled by the paradigm framework, um, which was important because I think there is uh, different groups of people that might want to use the code and people who work on theory, theoretical and applied mechanics are maybe not wanting to spend all of their time uh, working out the bookkeeping for parallel communication. So we, we strove to uh, take care of that for you. Right, so, and there's also a bunch of optional routines that you could implement, but don't have to. Uh, and the example I show here is compute Jacobian. So if you have an analytical form for a Jacobian, or if you wanna use some fancy uh, C++ techniques like automatic differentiation to compute that, you can do so. Uh, so this would be used to compute the tangent stiffness matrix. If you don't want to, or don't have the ability to implement those, that's okay. Paradigm will compute the tangent stiffness matrix by finite difference. Uh, hence, it's an optional routine. Right, the same is true generally for compute classes, right? So again, we have a C++ base class for compute classes. Um, and 
if you want to implement a new one, you derive from that, and it uh, will then get called automatically by Paradigm at the right times. Uh, the interface is pretty simple. I've, I've written sort of the two main required functions. One, you have to define what fields you are going to operate on in your compute class, and you can define your own field as well. So we saw examples of that in some of the example problems, right? I defined a field like, uh, in that case, it was global data, um, global data for the, the sum of the velocities for all the nodes in the sphere, right? So my compute class in that case is using the velocity field that already exists, and then it's creating a new field um, to be written to output, right? And then you have to write your the compute function to actually do the calculation, right? So in that case, very straightforward. Um, to give this a little more, to help explain this, I've, I have a list here at the bottom of some compute classes that uh, are distributed with Paradigm um, from the public facing repository. Uh, computing the stored elastic energy, the global kinetic energy. So these are pretty obvious quantities, but they're not actually needed to run the simulation. So they're, they're conceptually, they're secondary calculations. Uh, number, uh, neighbor statistics are something that are nice to look at in post-processing to make sure you have a, a reasonable number of neighbors for each of your points, or if you want to compute the volume of the neighborhood, things like that. Uh, radius is a, a variable that is used for visualization. So we know that there is a, a volume associated with each node in the discretization, but Paradigm doesn't, the idea that that's a sphere is, is sort of made up, right? In fact, we're computing that volume based sometimes on, a, on the volume of a hex or a tet element. Um, but for visualization and pair view, it's, it's nice to throw a sphere on that. And if you have an uneven a non-uniform discretization, then those spheres are all gonna be slightly different sizes and we can use this radius field um, for plotting, right? I, I showed you an example of the nearest point data and the block data compute classes in some of the example problems. All right, so now I'm, I think the next part, yep, yeah, I'm gonna talk about applications of paradigm. I have 12 minutes left, so I have I think, three of them. I can do four minutes each. Um, so these are these sort of go beyond the, the simple use cases that I've shown so far into, okay, let's say you're, you're doing research in paradynamics and you have, um, you wanna use paradigm to demonstrate your new ideas. The reason you'd wanna do that is because you can run large simulations with paradigm, right? Uh, in this case, I'm showing uh, the use of paradigm for identifying fragments in a paradynamic simulation. So this was work I did with a few other people, Stuart Silling and Paul Demi, uh, five years ago or so. And we wrote a conference paper on this. And I actually implemented this in a different code, but for the sake of some recent research, I have put this into Paradigm. The algorithms that shown there on the right, I'll not go through that in any detail. It does require repeated iterative traversing of the bond lists. So it, it breaks the simple model of a compute class, um, but that's okay, Paradigm can handle that. You just had to be a little careful about how you implemented it, how I implemented it. Um, in this case, the fragments are identified, uh, they're defined by groups of nodes that are connected by bonds, right? So each of the colors here represent a group of nodes that is completely separated from all the other um, fragments. And then I went ahead and defined, well, I call it paradynamic dust, but it's these very small fragments, anywhere from say one to five nodes that uh, are essentially completely separated from the rest of the discretization. And I grouped them together into a single fragment, which is shown here in dark blue. Uh, so this would be useful for things like comparing paradynamic simulations against experimental results. Um, one of the things they do when they do fragmentation experiments is compute something called the cumulative distribution function for mass, right? If you're gonna uh, break something in the laboratory and run that simulation over and over again, you don't, obviously you don't get exactly the same fragments in every case, but what you do tend to get are relatively stable 
in many cases, relatively stable distributions of fragment masses. So experimentalists like to plot that and this function added to paradigm allows you to compare the paradigm simulation against the experimental results. Okay, so two more examples of how we used paradigm for, for R&D. Um, so this is work that I did with, uh, with Pablo Salison and others on improving the accuracy of the integral calculations, um, specifically looking at neighbors that fall very close to the edge of the horizon. So I don't know, hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, there are certain nodes, right? There's, for, no matter how you set up your discretization, there's gonna be nodes that are very near the horizon boundary. And if all you're tracking are the X, Y, and Z coordinates of those nodes, then you're left with, well, I either declare it to be inside the horizon or outside the horizon. But as shown here, so this is a picture that Pablo put together, and I, I believe he had it in his presentation as well. Another way to think about this is that for each of those nodes, it's actually associated with a cell, and part of that cell is inside the horizon, and part of it is outside the horizon. So an attempt to improve the accuracy, which then translates to better convergence behavior. Um, we worked on partial val either partial area calculations for 2D, which is work that Pablo did, or partial volume calculations for three-dimensional simulations. And that's where we used paradigm. So the computational challenge is illustrated in these, you know, the two, the center image and the image on the right. So we have say a hex element intersecting with the horizon and we need to compute the fraction of that hex element that is inside the horizon and the fraction that's outside of it. Uh, in 2D, Pablo showed that you can work that out analytically, um, but in 3D, it's not so easy. It's a, I use a numerical approximation technique, which I tried to illustrate here on the right. It's essentially a sampling technique uh, to compute the, the fraction that's inside and outside the horizon. And then we, we ran a whole bunch of paradigm simulations and looked at convergence behavior uh, using that naive approach where a, a neighbor is either 100% in or 100% out of the neighbor list. We compared that against the use of partial volumes. And then we also looked at uh, a set of candidate of different influence functions to see if we could help with convergence behavior by using an influence function that smoothly decays near the horizon near the edge of the horizon, which I think lot, that's logical how that would help in this case. Um, convergence plot uh, data are shown there on the right. So I don't have time to get into all the details here, but essentially we, we expect to see, what we want to see is uh, well-behaved first order convergence, um, linear, you know, this, the lines on the right should be straight lines. Uh, if you use that naive approach, you get, convergence behavior that jumps all over the place. Sort of broadly speaking, you can show mesh convergence, but it's, it's pretty unsatisfying using these smoothly decaying influence functions or using the partial volume calculations resulted in much better convergence behavior. So you can see these ones at the bottom here uh, show the type of linear behavior we were hoping to see. All right, and the last one in the last five minutes here, I'll talk a bit about local and non-local coupling. So this is another place where paradigm allowed us to do simulations that would have been um, perhaps impossible without, without it. And I won't go into any details here. This is work, as far as the theory, this is work that I did with, with Marta Lea and uh, Mauro Perego, um, Pavel Bochev at Sandia came up with a lot of the original ideas around optimization-based coupling. Um, as far as paradigm goes, we used paradigm in this work to demonstrate that we could couple a mesh-free paradynamic code with a classical finite element code. Uh, and that, so I used a code called Albany for that. Um, it's, an, it's a finite element code that is also built on top of Trilinos. It was written by folks at Sandia. And the notion behind the optimization-based coupling is that we're going to define an overlap region where the meshless paradynamics domain overlaps with the classical finite element domain. And then we're gonna uh, minimize 
the difference in the solution over that overlap region. Um, the two models were going to act independently as constraints on the optimization problem. And the controls in this case are sets of virtual uh, boundary conditions, we call them, that are at the edges of the domains near the overlap region. So I have an illustration on the next slide that will hopefully make that a little more clear. Right, so we have uh, this very simple simulation of a, a bar with a pre-notch in it that's being pulled in tension. And we're using finite element models on the ends of the bar and the meshless paradynamic discretization in the center near where the crack is. Uh, so the controls that I'm, let me see where my mouse is, there we go. The controls are shown in dark blue. Uh, so these are the entities that the optimization routine is, is moving in an attempt to minimize the, the difference in the solutions in this overlap region. The real boundary conditions are applied on the ends shown in green. So in this case, we're applying a displacement to the ends of the bar, which are meshed with finite elements using the classic uh, elasticity model. And, and then hopefully the results here are self-explanatory. I can, we applied the boundary conditions to the ends, to the FEM mesh, the coupling technique uh, transfers that through the interface into the paradynamic model. Um, and as you can see, we, we capture the expected deformation. So this is useful in a couple of ways. One would be if you want to run uh, a large, complicated engineering analysis and you know that material failure is only going to occur in a very small portion, you might want to use classical finite element approach everywhere except in that one region where you apply paradynamics. So this coupling technique gives you a chance to do that. And the other exciting uh, possibility is to use this coupling technique for applying uh, boundary conditions to a non-local model, which is sort of a, uh, one of the open areas of research in paradynamics, as far as I'm concerned. Applying displacement boundary conditions is usually doable. Um, but if you want to apply, say, pressure load to a paradynamic model, it's less clear how to do that, right? You have to apply boundary conditions over a non-local collar. And uh, this coupling techniques allows you to transfer a pressure load, which is straightforward to apply to a finite element mesh of, a, of the classical theory uh, to, to the paradynamic model. All right, that uh, brings me to the end. I'll leave you with the the link for the Paradigm Repository, and uh, I will welcome any questions that folks have.